beautiful time for um, that beautiful introduction. Sometimes <clears throat> when these introductions are made, I'm a little bit afraid because it's a tough call. I have to live up to all of the beautiful words that people have <laughs> said and continue to say about me. It is definitely an honor to be here at this um, author's event today. Never in my life did I think that I would be called an author. But growing up as a child, I left my parents one holiday at the age of 12 and went to Bonn County, Liberia to spend a vacation with my aunt and my cousins. And because she worked in the reproductive health area, she went from village to village teaching women to do family planning, both the natural and the not so natural way. And as she did this work, she decided, I'm gone most of the day, so I'll put you all in a um, vacation school at the Catholic High School. We had a vacation program, and the students would decide which way they felt they would go. And me, being me, went to the writing club, and they gave us a project to write our own stories. They had this very famous Liberian writer called Barty Moore, and he wrote a lot of books about our cultural heritage and some of his readings, Murder in the Kesava Patch. It's, it's not as famous as um, um, the Chuna Chili, but he was the author that we knew and he was to re review all of the stories from us students and present them and find the winner from our group. And I remember at that tender age of 12, we went to this event and they called me up as the winner with the best story. As a prize, I got a whole box of his different writings. And as he handed me, the certificate, he said, you're going to be a great writer. Fast forward, many years later, as I struggled to even write grand proposals, I keep saying, where did he see that writing in me? I don't ever think that. But that I'm in the club of those who have written the book is something that I think is a milestone I'm grateful and I'm very grateful that you all have come to support my work and to listen to what I have to say. <clears throat> Yolanda Adams, a black American gospel artist, one of my favorites, sang a song, um, Keep the Dream Alive, Don't Let It Die. And that song says visions that can change the world trapped inside an ordinary girl and she's too afraid to let it out and she goes on to say never give up never give up never give up and as i look back at my life from the time i started working with young soldiers in 1998 a single mother of four children just leaving a very abusive relationship, going back to live with my parents, and not having a dime. My self-esteem was gone. Everything was gone. All of the powers and the intelligence and the intellect that I ever thought I possessed disappeared. And I was one person who was trapped in a space of anger, trapped in a space of pain, trapped in a space of having no future outlook. And when I came back home in 98, one of the turning points for me was my son, who was five at the time, always bouncing all over the place. My sister asked him, what did your mommy do in Ghana? And he said she did nothing, but she just sat down all day, just as you see her sitting there. 
So she said she didn't play with you, she didn't read. And that was when I had really allowed my situation in life to take total control of me. I did nothing but sit down and sit down. When I moved back to Liberia, my mother, and you see that space said to me, if you decide to change your life around, I will stand by you. I go to back to the university to try to get a degree. And the story was that we trained you in, two, in 93, 94. We want to do what you did with the certificate and you have to be involved in some community project. So I get this job to work with child soldiers. And as I start to work, I have my own visions of where I want to see these boys, how I want to see their children. But like Yolanda said in this song, it's trapped inside all of my visions of a better world, of a free world. Because I had identified myself as a failure, I was afraid to step out and fail. So all of the good things that I could have done with those child soldiers and their families, I never did because of that fear. Then in 2001, I'm introduced to something called the Women in Peace Building Network. And this, we're giving this concept, a young woman my age, Thelma Ikea, Nigerian, gave us this concept of women building peace, community of women rising to the occasion of all of the conflicts that we were seeing in West Africa and building peace. And she looked at me and said, you can take this back to Liberia and localize this concept. The vision is trapped. I'm too afraid to step out. And so from November to December to January, we keep having this conversation about starting a women peace building network and it's going nowhere. By April, May, she comes to Liberia and she takes me to this meeting of all Liberian women activists and say, we're starting something and this is the leader. Obviously, my identity was failure, fear, never amassing to anything because when I stayed in that abusive relationship, the only name my partner called me was stupid. My children called me stupid mama. And I believe I was stupid. So I was like, no, 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 no. You can make anyone the leader, but not me. And he said, no, we think you have it. And you should be. And then the women were objecting, who is she? She's a newcomer. And then I was like, yes, I'm a newcomer. You should give it to someone who's been in this place. Yes. I know nothing about it. Yes. And then the Twitter Copa takes me aside. And she said, Lima, shut up and stop that nonsense. Dry your tears. If those women smell fear in you, they will tear you up in a day. Go out there and be the leader that we all want you to be. I step out and gradually start treading carefully, slowly, fearfully, my visions of a women's peace movement. I will throw it out once, throw it out, out twice, and gradually the confidence starts to build up. And by 2003, we had a peace movement that is chronicled in the documentary, Pray the Devil Back to Hell. Women around the world hail Liberian women for the beautiful work that they've done. Is the fear gone? No. Every time something new, because you know, when people say, you are a visionary. That is a huge thing. And when you have these visions, you always have to put them out for the world to see. 
Great men and women didn't sit on their visions and their ideas. There are still visions, but there is also still this thing of fear which never goes away. But the beauty of the story of my life and the story of the Liberian Women's Peace Movement is that that vision that was trapped in me was also trapped in a lot of the women that I worked with. They had their own vision of how they wanted to see their communities, but they were afraid because of the suppression, oppression, and abuses that they faced over time. I fast forward to 2003. I meet this, no, I tried, 299. I meet this women pastor's wives and we go to this workshop and retreat that I'm supposed to facilitate and help them identify their powers and one of these women every morning comes out in white from head to toe and she sits there as soon as you say we need someone to pray she stands up and prays but even as she's praying you can see that there is a fire that is fighting to come out. And not to come out as a pastor's wife. But you see a community organizer trapped in something. And then I start to talk to her. What is your story? At 15, in the eighth grade, I'm giving to this older pastor as wife. And I gave birth to 12 children. And they're all alive. And sometimes I'm beaten. But I've been told my role in this world as a pastor's wife is to fast and pray for people. And stay out of conversations. So the white was her identity that the world had given to her. So we have the first workshop. And by 2002, 2001, we meet again. And nothing really comes out of all of our meetings. 2003, when we start the peace movement in Monrovia protesting, someone come from this village and said, this pastor wife has put these women together for peace. And she thinks her role is to mobilize them to fast and pray. So as they fast and pray, and they mobilize themselves for peace, we go into this community because I have been liberated. I have been liberated years before. And because I have been liberated, I could look in true women, both old and young, and see some of the fire that I have. And it was like, okay, this one needs liberation. And this one needs to be delivered, whatever way we want to call it. So we started doing trainings for these women, community-based trainings, leadership training, identifying your power. 2011, this pastor's wife that was socialized, and cloned to believe that her role in this world was to fast and pray was at the UN last year, speaking about the role of rural women in economic empowerment, building sustainable peace, and contributing to development. This pastor's wife served as one of the strategists for Ellen Johnson's selling re-election date. No one in her community dare vie for a political seat without seeking her counsel. Fast forward into another community. This is a very quiet woman trained as a traditional midwife. 
today, after years of engagement, she's gone to school and is a professional midwife, but is also a community leader. Her role and her place in the community is to mentor young girls. You will not have children before your time. And even if you made that mistake, I'll bring you to the fold and I'll work with you. The point that I'm trying to make to all of us today, and if you read the book, you will read about my life. I sank to a place where everyone who knows me never thought I would come out. Because it was one issue after the other. I have a friend in Minneapolis who I say is one of my biggest fans. She said to young people in Minnesota, like real young people, if you know of a person who have literally pulled themselves up by the strap of their boots, stood up tall, is my friend. I don't think anyone in this room had gotten to the place where they have to eat the leftover of people's food. I don't think any woman in this room has given birth to a child and slept on the cold floor for a week because she didn't have money. So, hey, I don't think anyone in this room had to take a preemie baby, and I have no idea that that was something doctors would do, and put him to her skin at night to keep him warm because she didn't have blankets. I don't think any woman in this room had to sacrifice The desire, I'll tell you a story. <laughs> I was taking my kids from school in Ghana as a refugee. And my son was four, my daughter was three. We used to walk because they lived a little stretch from, they went to school. And they went to school because one of my sister-in-laws was teacher and she had a scholarship. So that's how they went to school. She had, she had to give, get, as part of her school benefits, two students were allotted for them to come to school. So those two little children went to school. She had no children. One of the days we were walking, coming, and this man stopped his car and said, I will give you this. These are very beautiful children. So we enter his car and we're sitting, he says, where is their mother? And I'm, have, I'm wearing real tattered clothes. And I said, I am in return to be an idiot. Foolish girl. Look at your dirty self. Can you give birth to these decent children? Two things. I was hungry. I was tired. I could not walk. And my daughter had so much weight. And she would say, Mama, carry me, I'm tired. So I said to myself, if I even argue or protest, he will stop his car and put us down. I said, sir, I'm sorry. I lied. I am the maid. Their mother is at home. I said, hmm, see you. That's a thing like you. Can you give birth? I said, no, sir. My children kept quiet because I kept praying, Lord, this four-year-old boy that will answer to anything, please just like his mom. We get down from the car and he turned to me. Why was he insulting you? And then I said, why didn't you talk? He said, no, I didn't want him to put us down. <laughs> when someone kept to that point in their life, I think that's what they call the pig. So today, I'm on a mission. I'm on a mission for women's empowerment, women's rights, gender equality, whatever you call it. 
But I'm also on a mission because I believe that when we have a stable society void of conflict, the other half of the population have chances. But when there are wars and when there are conflicts, the sufferings that we see even in peacetime increases. So my mission now is to go from community to community and say to women, it's good to sit back, it's good to give birth to children, it's good to be in the, in the shadows. But I pray that your comfort zone is not rocked. Because there is no way we can have a functional world regardless of how you see it, if 50% of the world is not contributing in a meaningful way. So it's not just contributing to the social development of our communities, but it has to be from peace to economic to security to social, you name it, until the 50% of the world's population is involved in that kind of thing, there is no way that we can have a stable world. So in New York, you will have conversations about the threats of terrorism as we celebrate the 10th anniversary of 9-11. But until there is a space created for women to add their voices to that dialogue, we're going nowhere. In the Congo, in Afghanistan, until women add their voices to these things, we're going nowhere. You're looking at equality, issues of equality, so I'm, I'm just out there and saying to people, I will go to anywhere my message will stick and tell people that there is so much value. For those of you who have been to Liberia and those of you who haven't been there, when we the war ended, we had a budget, our national budget was $50 million. Our 2010-2011 budget was over 200 and something million, 400% increment. Today, Liberia is a place where we have decentralization. And it's not just because we have a female president, but because we have a population of women that will not sit still. <coughs> so when it comes to issues of social, they are involved. The political issues, women are stepping out now. All of the different issues, yes, we have rape on the increase, teen prostitution on the increase, but it's not because we're not doing anything. I think traditionally where women sat down and never really reported cases of rape in their communities, the reporting has increased, so it's like the cases are increasing. So it's no longer a situation where someone is going to negotiate with an uncle who raped on this. Women are going to the courts. And for the first time, as a result of women's mobilization, we have one of the strongest rape law in all of West Africa. 12 to life, no bail. Men in the bar association of Liberia call it the most barbaric law. <laughs> but no one sees rape as barbaric. So they're saying, can we go back to the drawing board and reform this law? And the women are saying, can we go back to the drawing board and reform the minds of men that rape? <laughs> because until we can have that kind of stability, there is no way that we're going to negotiate this law. So you see that kind of, so that 50%, and that's the mission that I find myself on. Going out there, mobilizing women, talking to women, talking to girls. Because I say to people, I'm almost 40, and I'm already exhausted. <laughs> I was just telling Pam as we sat in the green room, I flew in from Chicago at 2 a.m. this morning. By 3, I was in my hotel room, and by 3.30, my two-year-old woke up, and she's roaming like a witch. <laughs> I want to watch Mickey Mouse. I want to watch Mickey Mouse. <laughs> and then I said, Neko P, if you don't come and sleep, I'll kill Mickey Mouse. <laughs> <laughs> to be at CGI delivering a keynote. So it's like a never ending thing. But do I get tired? Sometimes. <coughs> but
But do I want to start? No. Because when you go into communities and listen to the stories from Liberia to Zimbabwe to Sierra Leone to Nigeria to Congo, the issues of women and girls are appalling. Last year, we brought 150 young women together with our president. And they were supposed to sit and tell her their issues. When 14 years old, stand up in front of a TV camera and say, Madam President, I'm a sex worker. And men sleep with me for 50 Liberian dollars, which is less than one US dollar a night. And sometimes I sleep with seven men. She's this tall. When young people stand up and say, can you put cameras in our schools to see the level with which our teachers are sexually abusing us? No woman who has a heart for change, no man who has a heart to see change can stand it. One of the little girls lost her parents and she had three siblings, the older one. And she said, my one desire was to set an example for these children and finish high school. We went to stay with our uncle. He said he didn't have money to send us to school. So because she's athletic, she went to one of the high schools and got a scholarship. She said the first day of school, she got a good awakening. The sports director, who was responsible for her getting the scholarship, came to her class by 10. Come. She followed him. And for the next year, it was 10 o'clock every day, and he would sex her till 2. She left that school and went to another school. And so for three years, she endured sex at the hands of male instructors. And she stood in front of the president and said, Madam President, my desire is to have a college degree. But if I have to be sexed to get that degree, I'm not trying it. When you stay in communities and see and hear some of these stories, you can do nothing but say to yourself, the struggle must continue. The work must go on. When 10 and 12 years old little boys look you in the eye and say, what are women made for but to have sex? You know that the next generation have a problem. My call and my purpose for writing that book was to serve as a call to action. And people always ask me, what can we do for your community? And I found a new way of answering, what can you do for your community? Because in each and every one of our communities, we have issues. I've been to the Bronx, I've been to Jersey, I've been to different places, and I've been to some of the richest high schools in this country. And what you see amongst the young people is what you see in Liberia. A whole generation crying out for mentors. A group of young people that the media have told your body begins from here and ends here. Your brain is no longer a factor. As a matter of fact, you don't have to work with your hands. From Liberia to Cape Town to Kenya to USA to Great Britain, that is what you see. What can you do? What visions do you have within yourself that is trapped and you're too afraid to let go? If you step out once, it's like a volcanic eruption because it keeps coming out and keeps coming out. <laughs> and sometimes you won't even believe yourself because you go and look at yourself in the mirror and you go like, wow, did I say that at that meeting? Or did I do that? Or did I challenge this person? Because it comes out and comes out. What is the vision that you have? 
I still have a lot of visions. And sometimes it's a little bit frightening to put it out there. But then also, if you live in societies like I find myself in, it's not an option, it's not a day's job, it's a survival strategy. I'll take questions. <coughs> when we protested was to, the first phase of our protest was to create an awareness <coughs> amongst women. Previously, Liberian like, women did not believe that they had a stake, women from rural grassroots community, in the issues of peace and security. So when we started, we started with a campaign slogan, Liberian like, women awake for peace. So it was like that call to action. By the time we did that kind of mobilizing for nine months, we got into the actual protest for peace. And when we ended the protest by the signing of the peace agreement and the installation of the transitional government, we came back and said to women, you know, we will not go back and sit down. So we started doing something we call constructive interference. So we're just into everything. By the time it came time for civic and voters' education, we started because those same women who have not been involved in peace activism have never really been involved in political activities. Liberia became an independent country in 1847. It was not until 1950 that indigenous men, property owners, and educated women were allowed to vote. So in the lifetime of some of those rural women, they have never exercised their rights to vote. Their socialization had been, don't get involved, it's not your place. So we had to start a whole new campaign to get those women, even though they have been involved in peace activism. And when you, every time you went to some of them and said, have you registered to vote? They will say to you, what good is it going to do for us? It's never been our place. The men will get the power and they will treat us the way they want to treat us. So it was issuing challenge to them. By the time we had gone for the first round and there was a runoff elections, because it would have been very difficult to encourage anyone to vote for a woman's president on the first round with 21 presidential candidates. When it came to the soccer star versus the woman, we had to mobilize around the woman. And at the end of the day, some of the men, and I think one of the, the benefits of having the women's peace movement was that men who had never really entrusted society, the politics of society into the hands of women, had seen our determination. And a lot of them were saying, well, Maybe the women are the hope for this country. If they could deliver peace to us, let's give them the politics. So we had a lot of allies now saying, let's give this thing to the women. So it was that starting from the peace movement, but it didn't just evolve naturally. We had to do a whole lot of conscientization around political activities to really get women fired up. Yes, and we go to elections in a few weeks, October 11th. Questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, do you have similar stories about um, a sort of aha moment for men and boys when you sort of talk about how powerful it is when um, women and girls claim their rights and realize you know, that they have this power inside them that they describe? Do you have similar stories of when um, boys or men Well, we see it every day. But one of the things that I think we still 
have to work on. You have very good young men, but the stereotypes, <clears throat> when a boy is nice, the natural stereotype, and I don't know if it's part of this community, but is that it's leaning more towards being a gay. Mm -hmm. So you find boys, when we screen the films, the film in different places, pray the devil back to hell. If you ask questions, boys are a little, yes, they want to engage, but they are a little bit hesitant and they're looking at their friends to see what their reaction will be before they can make any kind of comment. I went to collegiate in 2008, all boys private school here in New York, and their senior class had invited me to speak. I was about a week away from having my sixth child. So I am this big, <laughs> and these young men sit and we're having a conversation. And I said to them, you know, when I read about your school, one of the first things that came in my face was that a lot of you young men here are being trained, are being trained to be cutthroats. So you go into the business world and don't give a whatever for who's that, who's losing. You don't care about the community as long as your business interest is pushing forth. And the question that I had for them was, even if you are a business tycoon, what are you changing? What are you doing? And we had a whole long conversation about community service, and they got really, really honest. I gave birth to this baby, and I'm in the hospital, and this big box arrived, and I opened the envelope, a note was there, the teacher wrote, Lima, thanks for destroying my Saturday. I had to take 20 young men to every baby store in New York, and they could not agree on a present for the child. <laughs> so they ended up buying a boy's outfit with collegiate color for my daughter. <laughs> June of this year, I speak at the commencement exercise of the Marymount High School here in New York. And two young men walk up to me and say, ma'am, you don't remember us, but you remember you, you came to collegiate, you spoke to us. We started doing community work, and we're going to college with a desire to make a good impact in the world. I felt like, yes, yes, yes. I've done something. We've done something. But the point is, there are a lot of good men. But a lot of the good men have just sat back and said, well, it's too difficult. And so you see a lot of evil men putting evil in the faces of our children until we step out and engage and give them positive messages we will have a serious problem. I have a 15-year-old son that I'm so proud of. At school, they say this is the only boy who will sign up to do service at orphanages. He will give the girls seat. He's such a gentleman. I have an 18-year-old who's sophomore at a university here, and we are constantly having a struggle because he is carrying the blame. <laughs> And he sees himself as the best thing that ever happened to the girls born around the time he was born. <laughs> and we're still really working on it. And sometimes I say to good men, you need to engage with some of these boys. I'll tell a last story. I went to French Seminary High School, French High School here in New York, another wealthy high school. And we screened the film and gave a talk. At the end of the talk, this little Hispanic boy came and stand before me, and tears is running down his cheeks. And he said to me, "Man, you put my life into perspective. 
My mother and my grandmother are immigrants to this country. They sent me to this school because they want to give me the best. And I've never really appreciated it. Sometimes they will hurdle in the back and be afraid to come forward. And then I have to say, oh, please, gentlemen, I'm looking for love in my life. I need a puppy. <laughs> there's a rush. <laughs> but we definitely need to engage with the young people. We have a girls and leadership project in Liberia. And I've been working with young girls who have been prostituting themselves and doing different negative things. One of the little girls who is about to graduate from university said to me, every time she had financial problem, the only thing that came to her mind, your body can provide. So as we engaged, I said to her, there's always a way out. And she came back to me a few months ago and said, yes, I tried it. I couldn't get school fees upon my mother's property deed, and then I set out to look for a job. At that time, the Liberian Telecommunication Agency was looking for hostesses for a conference, and I applied. It was 10 days of hard work. They paid me $500. I retrieved my mother's deed. I was able to pay some of my rent, pay some of the remainder of my school fees, and I sat back say Auntie Lima was right. There's always another way. So you have these situations. And these young people are just looking for people to say, this is the way. It's not always easy. It's not always successful. But once you plant a seed, they will go forward and sometimes you will see the harvest. Question? Yes, ma'am. Yes. I didn't get a feeling of um, the role of the um, older people in influencing the young people there at all. What are the elder people doing? You know, two things have happened in our communities. Older women look at the young generation, they are appalled. These girls, they are no good, useless, going to be nothing. That's their verdict, husband snatchers, and all of the negative things. So as part of our work with doing communities now, we bring the girls to talk their issues. And we take the older women and sit in the back, don't say anything, listen. Sometimes by the time we end, those women are crying because there's a recognition that they fail the girls in their communities. We went to one of the port cities in Liberia, and as these girls talked about the issue, we had a hundred girls in the room, and maybe 75 of them had some sexually transmitted disease that they were hiding. It was the community women now that we mobilized to take these girls to the doctor. And some of them would come back and say, we never really understood their struggle. But like any intergenerational issue is happening here, it happens everywhere, even in different professional fields. The young people are saying these old people need to retire and get away. And the old people are saying retire to go where? Because this is the only life that we've known. We haven't really, especially within the women's movement, started a dialogue, succession planning, how we graduate our older people and continue to look up to them as honorary advisor and whatever you want to call it. Because I have come to really value the wise counsel of some of the peace activists and feminists that I've sat with. 2008 Easter Sunday was one of the groundbreaking times for me. I spent that entire Sunday after church with glorious time. Some of the things that we just hung out and we chatted, but the lessons from that encounter I continue to carry even as I do my work today. So I think there is a need also for the older people, and that's what we've been saying to the Liberians, step into the space. Ma'am, i tell you one thing. If you have two teenage girls 
living in your community and you're sitting on your porch and they're passing by and you just call them and start a conversation trust me you see them hovering around your house to come back for that conversation on a regular basis not to chastise them but just to start gradually they will come and they will come and they will come and they will come and they will all of the time. I work in an office with 14 staff. We have only two men. And we have one older, one, two other older women. The rest of the girls that work with us are young graduates. Lunchtime, I leave my office and just sit with them and hang out. And I'll ask them about their weekends and we just talk about things, talk about things. And sometimes I say, you people need to start looking for better jobs because we don't pay you much here. You say, no, madam. Some of the advices we get from you, no amount of money can give it to us. So we think we want to stay as well. You can't stay till you're old. We need to bring in the younger women to keep on. There is young people are just looking for older people to reach out. If you live in a community where you, you encounter young children, black or white, try it and see. Just call one person, what's up, how are you today? Even if they have that air of, you know, the next time, you know, you're my friend, I want you to be my friend, they will come back. And sooner or later, stories that even their mothers have not heard, you will start hearing it. But the older women, they're busy to answer your question, doing their thing, fasting and praying for peace. And the younger women are on their side doing their thing. So right now, we're at this place where we say, we need to bring them together to understand the value of our struggle. Or else, all of this is for nothing. Yes, ma'am. you know are not prepared to encounter or engage with that kind of issue. So it's these girls that we have to deal with. But it is a difficult issue. And it's not just in our societies what we see. It's not just payment for sex in red light districts. But it's men in churches, in schools, in universities, who take advantage of girls because of their economic status and become godfathers, as they call themselves, and put these girls in an apartment or and just control their lives and try to, to just, they're just there. We see it all over the place. We haven't even started that conversation because again, some of those men are our fathers, our brothers, our uncles, those of us who are bold, we try to talk about some of these things. And then all you get is this is something that has been happening since before you were born. And do you think you are the one who can come and change it? So then our option is how do we create situations and conditions for girls so that they don't easily fall prey to some of these things because it takes two to tango. If these girls are not interested, these men will have no option but to find their equals. But we haven't started yet. The challenges are immense. And the thing is, for my work, it's not just Liberia. And when you look at the situation of girls, it's not just Liberia. We had a conference bringing together girls from Ghana, Nigeria, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. Ghana and Nigeria are quote unquote peaceful countries. All of the issues those girls listed, there was no difference between peaceful and post-conflict. The issues were the same. Yes, ma'am. Uh, oh, sorry, sir. Can you explain what exactly is sex? I was hoping that would never come up. 
Well, well, the sex track is something that we 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 never read the Greek play, <laughs> so we didn't have any idea of that Greek play, and we decided as a means of getting our men to um, get involved, we needed to jolt them to the reality of the situation that they were in. We would do sex strike. So we would deny them sex as our means of protesting at home whilst we protested outside. We failed miserably in the urban areas. The rural women were smarter than we were. So they went to their husbands and said to them, you know, when the Bible talks about, and the Quran talks about fasting, is denying yourself the pleasures of life. So because we are fasting and praying for peace, we can't have sex. So they didn't put the sex track in their husband's faces like we did. They went around it, and these men in the rural communities were like, yes. We were all fast and pray. <laughs> One of the communities, those women kept at it. When we ended our campaign, I saw all of these men march down with presents. Not urban areas, rural areas. And as they came into the hall, they asked, could they make presentation one after the other? They celebrated their wives. I'm sure a bit of the sex thing was in there. <laughs> but also the hard work that those women have done was something that we recognize in their community. I'll take one more, and then we have to step out of this way. Yes, sir. Uh, how do you mention um, some of the things you were like you uh, used earlier uh, to a young woman, a teenager, that they actually have a stake in their struggle? as opposed to just competing with men. Please repeat your question. Well, I'm trying to get to is, uh, you know, young girls who don't feel that they are, I guess, worthwhile enough to stand their own ground, uh, falling victim to some of the sexual issues that you, you mentioned, not only here in the broad, but how do you instill a value or build that value system of, of saying you do have a stake in the community um, I, don't know, I think you, you just come to it with a kind of non judgmental attitude. In 2005, when we ended the protest, we had to go to every community where these women worked to shut down their protests and reaffirm their work by doing different activities. And in one of the communities, the girls that had fought, the female combatants decided to join the group to end the protest. The women left the celebration, protesting that these girls were perpetrators and they were not peace women and they would not join them. So we have, have to call off the celebration and go back to sit with these women to really start talking. It was almost two hours. The program is on hold. The girls were saying they would not relent. Because by virtue of what they had done in the community, the men were not willing to accept them. And if their mothers would not accept them, where did they have to go? So we went and sat with these women, and for over an hour, we had to talk and talk and talk. They agreed to come back for on grounds that the girls should remain in the back and should not come forward to where they were doing their celebration. We agreed to that. But then afterwards, the work we started to do with that community was to say to them, you have to, you have to bring these girls back. Because what we were saying was that they were more willing to accept the boys back into the community than they were willing to accept the girls. So we have to keep talking and keep talking. So as we go into different communities, one of the things we do is to really just reaffirm the good in everyone, regardless of what role you play. One of the brightest girls in our project, in one of the areas we work, by the time we were about to give them their whatever and they were going to meet with the president so that she could affirm them as Liberia's next generation leaders, she was pregnant. 
And so we had to do seven days of training and then do other activities before taking them to this big program where the president would receive them. Her parents threw her out. The head of a particular region that you probably call a state and you say the governor took her in. And this woman called us and said, this is one of your brightest girls, but this is her situation. We sat down scratching our heads because we have this, these are things that we talk about, safe sex and all of these things, and this was totally far away from all of the values that we've been teaching them over the years. We decided to bring her to the training, but then as part of the community, we'll have her sit with other girls and let's just have a conversation about the consequences of her action. So we we'll talk about her life, but use it as a model for other girls to see and something for them that could follow, but not being judgmental. She spent seven days with us in the training, and after the seven days, we said to her, you know what, life is about rewards and punishment. And we don't want to say punishment, but in this particular instance, we're not going to reward your situation by taking you to meet with the president. It's been three years. She suffered no encouragement. And she's saying to us, just bringing it back to the girls, reaffirm my belief in myself that I wasn't in waste and that my life wasn't over. Today, when we do our girls project in different communities, we bring teen mothers and we make provisions for their children to be taken care of whilst they participate. And all of these little things at the end of the day, we affirm these girls that you know what? With this one <coughs> child, my life doesn't end here. I can still be something out of what I do. So never judging, but always just saying to them, we're here. My book, I've been saying to the publishers and to everyone, I want to take back to Africa, to communities here, slum communities everywhere, and let girls read it. Because my story is a story of every situation that anyone can go through. From war to domestic violence to this to that to the other. But I'm still standing strong by the grace of God.